uh, I note that this session is called Scientific Observations, uh, and I would like to, to concentrate on this subject, uh, models, data, and quote data. And you will see that there is a rather murky area between data and quote data. Uh, now here's the, the first part we ha have to acknowledge is that the surface temperature of the planet is warmer than it was 100 years ago. There are two warmings. The first one starts about 1910 uh, and ends about 1945, and the second one begins around 1976 and appeared to have ended in around uh, 1998 or 1997 uh, until the data was changed, and I'll discuss that at length. Uh, now, <clears throat> it is gospel, and uh, Gavin Schmidt from NASA, who heads the GIST lab now, is on the record as saying all warming, uh, all of this warming is caused by human activity. I can't necessarily believe that because the first warming started in the year 1910 and we had only raised the CO2 concentration 18 parts per million above the background. If an 18 part per million rise can, get, can give rise to a temperature rise of a half a degree, it would be hotter than hell right now and we would, would not be discussing this. However, one of the things that accompanies greenhouse warming is a cooling of the stratosphere. And these, this is the, the uh, University of Alabama, Huntsville, Spencer Christie, uh, lower, lower stratosphere temperatures. And you can see the, there's two volcanoes there. This is El Chichon, that is Pinatubo. Uh, they induce warming in the stratosphere. But you can see a general decline in stratospheric temperatures until the late 1990s, the same point at which the warming appears to stop unless you change the data. Uh, and then there's this little problem right here, the so-called pause. Um, running uh, very, this is very clear in the Had Crew version 5 um, data set, which has since, since been substituted with the Had Crew version 6. And I'm going to show you the difference between the two versions. Uh, this is the, wait a minute. Oh, how does this go backwards? Ah. Okay. I'm going to show you the southern hemisphere first. Southern hemisphere is almost all water. It's got this big block of ice down there called Antarctica where there's really no data. Uh, and the difference between these two records, which is this line here, is pretty much negligible. Now let's go back to the northern hemisphere. And what you see is, wow, a hockey stick occurred in recent years in the new iteration of the Had Crew record. How did this happen? Well, this is the Had Crew record as it stands now. All these data up here, mu much of the data in the northernmost latitudes is new. And those land temperatures up there are warming pretty substantially. And so the Hadley people, what they do is they only express temperatures where they have data. So they have no temperatures out over the Arctic Ocean. Now you and I know that most of the year the Arctic Ocean is covered with ice, and even in the summer, a large part of it is mixed ice water. So you can't take a land temperature and project it out over the Arctic Ocean. Yet, Jim Hansen's group, Gavin Schmidt and company, have draw 1,200 mile or 1,200 kilometer circles around stations and blend them. In other words, they're taking the temperature, say, at resolute uh, in the higher, higher latitude, highest latitudes of the northern hemisphere and projecting it out over that mixed ice water ocean whose temperature must remain at 29 degrees skin temperature. That's the freezing point of seawater. You mix a glass of water, water with ice and it maintains a temperature of freezing until all the ice is gone. Uh, so that, that's, that's a real problem So because we have this area with no data that if you extend the land data over it, you put erroneous warming into it. And if you don't use it at all, you have uh, um, uh, an area that we know is not changing in temperature ignored in the record. And uh, so here's the new, uh, 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 this is the new record. And you can see what happens is all of a sudden uh, the pause begins to disappear. So how do you get rid of the pause? Well, the first 
place this happened was with Carl et al. in Science Magazine in 2015. What Carl et al. did was they changed the source of sea surface temperatures. We were using satellites, which seemed pretty good, nice universal coverage, and they switched to mixing intake temperatures from ocean-going ships to buoys, drifting buoys put out by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Well, the intake temperatures have terrible problems. Uh, some ships are big, some ships are small. The intake water is taken at different levels in the atmosphere. Anybody on board a ship in the summer knows the metal gets kind of hot. And uh, uh, the buoy temperatures, <laughs> uh, there's a growing and growing and growing network of buoys. All the buoy data were adjusted upward by 12 hundredths of a degree C. Yes. Why? To match the crummy onboard ship data. So more and more buoys are put out, particularly in the early part of this century, guaranteed you're going to raise the temperature record. It was a guarantee. And even so, the 2015 paper stated that the rise in temperature that now was in the data was significant at the 0.1 level. And that was in Science Magazine. How the editors let them get away with that, obviously they wanted them to get away with it. Um, then you can change the physics. You could do what Cowtan and Way did. Cowtan and Way took those Arctic stations, land stations, and using a technique called Krieging, uh, they creak data into the Arctic Ocean. They didn't get any more information. There's no new data. They just added apparent information. And of course, with the land records warming up, they therefore warmed up the ice water ocean. And guess what? They, didn't, they, they, bought, they busted a pause too. So, excuse me. Uh, yeah, so this is what Carl did, substitute the shipboard temps or satellite raised the ever-growing buoy readings by 0.12, more buoys equals more artificial warming. Now the pause warms at the 0.1 level. Kautan and Wei infilled Arctic Ocean data with land data, added no new ground truth information, and violated basic physics. That's how you bust a pause. Uh, in fact, here is the Kautan and Wei temperature, uh, bet uh, the difference between it and the Hadley temperature record that existed at the time. And you can see this is how you bust a pause. Uh, and then, of course, there's the growing disparity in the tropics. Uh, this is a very famous graph by John Christie uh, that is presented in front of Congress, uh, where you have uh, the average of all, of the, each piece of colored spaghetti is a uh, climate model. And here is the reality from roughly 850 millibars to 300 millibars, about 5,000 to 30,000 feet. Now I want you to look very carefully at this graph. I'm going to get a closer look at it in a second. Um, when you do weather forecasting, what you do is you don't take all the forecast models. I think there are eight global models now. There may be more. And average them up and say, ah, that's the weather forecast for today. No, you don't do that. You look and you see which one seems to be working in this situation, or which two seem to be working. You might blend those two. But in our policy world, we average all these things up. Best scientific practice would be to see if there was a model that actually worked, and there is. If you look very closely, there's a, there's a line here. That is a Russian model, INMCM4, called the special prosecutor, because they're interfer interfering with our climate. And uh, to take a look at it in the, in the vertical, uh, again, each one of these pieces of colored spaghetti is climate model. This is uh, near the surface. This is up about uh, uh, 18,000 feet. And then this is up about 30,000 feet or so. Uh, these are the observations from weather balloons, different, four different sets of weather balloon data. And these are the climate models. And lo and behold, there's a line that looks pretty good. This one right there. Again, more evidence for the special prosecutor because it's INMCM4. Now, is this important? Yeah. It's the vertical distribution of temperature in the tropics that determines upward motion. 
And upward motion in the tropics transmits most of the moisture in our atmosphere to the atmosphere. Almost all the precipitation that falls here in Washington, D.C. originates in the tropics. So if you get this wrong, that means you've gotten every downstream precipitation-related forecast wrong. Or if it's right, it's right for fortuitous reasons. Uh, and as you know, when the surface is wet, the sun's energy goes towards evaporation of moisture rather than direct heating. So the daily temperature regime changes considerably. You get this wrong, and you get that wrong, and you get everything else wrong. Um, this is a, a newer version of the original chart. Now, this is not the same slice of the atmosphere. This was published by Christie and McKittrick uh, last year. Uh, this is from 200 to 300 uh, uh, hectopascals. It's about, uh, it's about 25,000 feet up in the atmosphere. It's right in the middle of the hot spot. And you can see, again, the green one here. That's INMCM4, uh, obviously, and, and this is reality. Um, it works. Ah, hint, INMCM5 is trickling out of the Mathematical Institute in Russia. And you know what? It has a pause when the pause occurred. It simulated it. Uh, so the idea that all the warming is caused by uh, human activity is preposterous, completely preposterous. In uh, 1910, the carbon dioxide concentration was 298 parts per million. There's a bunch of calculations you can, you can run. And uh, the net forcing uh, in uh, 1910 was about plus 0 0.05 watts per meter squared. You're not going to see that in the temperature record. If that initiated a half a degree of warming again, it would be so hot we wouldn't be having this meeting. Uh, here are more recent estimates of equilibrium climate sensitivity. This is, of course, the IPCC average of 3.5. And by the way, um, the new IPCC report is going to use a different suite of models, CMIP 6. And let's double down. They're warmer than the ones in CM5. Uh, in, in, in CMIP 5. Uh, this is the lowest IPCC at 2.1 degrees equilibrium. Christian McNider uh, using calculations based upon the satellite data at 1.7 degrees C. And Lewis and Curry using very uh, realistic uh, estimates, revised estimates of forcing from sulfate aerosols through history. Uh, and using non-infilled Arctic data, in other words, the actual data that we have, uh, got about 1.5 degrees C. Uh, these estimates, I think, are consistent with what's being observed. Now, I'm going to close with a little, little moral lecture here. Do climate scientists cheat? Are there pressures to cheat? This comes from Paul Vusen in Science Magazine. And the date of this publication is very significant. It was October 28th, 2016, about 10 days before something important happened. Uh, indeed, whether climate scientists like to admit it or not, nearly every model has been calibrated precisely to the 20th century climate records. In other words, the warming of the early 20th century also. Otherwise, it would have ended up in the trash. It's fair to say that all models have tuned it, said this guy from Princeton. This is from Science Magazine. For years, climate scientists had been mum in public about their, quote, secret sauce. What happened in the models stayed in the models. That taboo reflected fears that climate contrarians would use the practice of tuning to seed doubt about models. Well, damn it, that was a good prediction. <laughs> so they're tuned on this whole 20th, 20th century, including that. Uh, and the unintended consequences of that tuning is to make the models wrong. Um, this was the article in Science, climate scientists opened up their black boxes to scrutiny, um, and it talks about, uh, it's describing a paper that has not yet appeared by Frederick Hordan et al., who heads the French climate effort, and that paper is called The Art and Science of Climate Model Tuning. Uh, in Hordan, read these words. With in the increasing diversity in the application of climate models, the number of potential targets for tuning increases. There are a variety of goals for specific problems, and different models may be optimized to perform better on a particular metric related to specific goals 
expertise, or cultural identity of a given modeling center. I do not make that up. The forerunner for this paper was by Moritzen et al. Uh, a, a few years before, uh, in which they described tuning of the, the Max Planck Institute model. Uh, to get it ready for CMIP-5, the guy who ran the model, Ernst Reckner, uh, was unavailable. So it befell to the graduate students and the postdocs, et cetera, to get the model ready for prime time. And they got the model to work, and lo and behold, it predicted 7 degrees C, equilibrium warming. In their words, quote, we had to get that number down, end quote. In other words, if your result is out of line, or if you're a person like me that's generally out of line, we've got to get that number changed. And that's precisely what they did. But when they wrote up what they did to the model, it turned out that lots of portions of the model were simply black boxes. Because you see, these models take decades to develop. And armies of graduate students and postdocs, et cetera, go through them and, you know what? They don't take notes. And so we don't even know what's in it. It's like the health care bill. <laughs> Here's a, a quote from Hordan. One can imagine changing a parameter which is known to affect the sensitivity, keeping both this parameter and the equilibrium climate sensitivity in the anticipated acceptable range, oh my god, and returning the model otherwise with the same strategy towards the same targets. So you see, it's the anticipated acceptable range that is put in, not by the model, but by the scientist. It's the scientist, not the science, that determines what is anticipated and acceptable. Which is why the models all tend to cluster around a certain value, with the exception of the Russian one. The Russian one, uh, the heat capacity in the, of the ocean in the Russian model is twice as large as it is in the others, so therefore it warms up much, much slower. And that's what I would have to say is this talk was titled Mo Data, Models, and Quote Data. And now you have seen data, models, and quote data. Thank you very much. Thank you.